Mackenzie! Sergeant, where's your belt? Uh, I, I don't know, Sergeant. Where's your bonnet? I, I, I don't know either. Where have you been? We were just out at the public house, Sergeant. I, I know it's a, well, it's not late, it's kind of early, but nobody got into any trouble. Honest, there was no trouble at all. Messing about with your rifle brigade pals, hmm? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, yes, Sergeant. A fine bunch of lads, them. Except they're always doubling around everywhere, and God, they go on and on and on about Baker rifles. I, I don't know what it is. I've never heard of a Baker rifle, and I didn't even think. Well, Bakers had rifles. They don't in our battalion, I think. And well, they have aprons, but Shut I, up. the Baker rifle is a little bit before your time. <laughs> but I'm thinking to myself that maybe you should go back and talk to your rifle brigade pals. Hmm. Right now? Maybe take some lessons. You say they're doubling around a lot? Well, maybe some of that'll rub off on you. Do you know why? Uh, I, I don't know, Sergeant, no. I'll tell you why. Because that's where you'll be doing on the way to the cookout! That's right. The potatoes are waiting. In the last video in the series, we examined the 1888 Slade Wallace Valise Equipment and the 1908 Pattern Web Equipment. Over the intervening time, more projects have been undertaken and more kit has been added to the collection. In this video, we'll examine the kit used to represent a rifleman of the 95th during the early 1800s, the 24th foot in the late 1870s, and for the possibility of some later Great War projects, a Seaforth Highlander of the 1917-1918 time frame. Before we begin, perhaps a short note on the activity of historical shooting. Historical shooting ranges somewhere on the scale between target shooting and reenactment. The key components of historical shooting are original or good quality reproduction firearms and ammunition, functionally accurate equipment and sometimes clothing, and the reference and use of period manuals, documentation, as well as anecdotal evidence. Put together, these make up a fascinating area of study that combines multiple disciplines, but always has as its foundation, shooting. As viewers of the channel may be aware, I presented aspects of the Baker rifle for quite some time without the use of any particularly historical clothing. Last year, I decided to complete the presentation and add a representation of a uniform as worn by the 95th, the primary user of the Baker rifle. Tracing its origins to 1800, with the raising of what was termed the Experimental Corps of Riflemen, the 95th was brought into the line in 1802, and they were granted the use of a distinctly different uniform. Rather than the red as worn by the line infantry, they were clothed in a dark shade of green, henceforth known as rifle green. This set them apart from the rest of the army, both in uniform and weaponry. Famously, the 95th and two other regiments, the 43rd and the 52nd, were brought to Shorncliffe Camp, where they were trained under Sir John Moore in light infantry drill and tactics. This period saw the embryonic formation of a new light infantry arm, which would stand in good stead as the army found itself fighting the French in Spain a few years later. This new regiment not only wore green, but also adopted black colored accoutrements. This gave a overall subdued look, which contrasted starkly with the rest of the line. Although the art of camouflage was not yet practiced as it is today, the darker hue of the 95th certainly gave the impression of being better suited to outpost work by night and other specifically light infantry roles. The uniform consisted of a cap, sometimes known as a shako, which resembled that of the line infantry, only with the addition of a squared off peak that some research would seem to indicate. This was decorated with the green light infantry tuft, a cord, and a badge of a horn, which would become a symbol for all light infantry, as commands on the battlefield, especially those in extended order, were given by its sounding. Early in the period, this was a simple syndrilical affair, 
but this was superseded by a more ornate design from 1812. Famously, this later pattern was the one that was worn at Waterloo. As I've chosen to represent a rifleman from the earlier part of the Peninsular War, the stovepipe shako was perhaps the more appropriate. The jacket differed from the line not only in colour, but also in its absence of lace. During this era, regiments had lace woven in regimental patterns, and this was used to sew around collars and was arranged to different patterns around buttonholes. Instead, the 95th simply had three rows of buttons down the chest, one row for the actual fastening of the jacket and two for decoration. Common with all regiments, the 95th had a facing colour. This was black and was displayed on cuffs, collar, and shoulder straps. The jacket was furnished with a pocket, or even perhaps two by some research, under the armpit for the carriage of the powder flask, which was used for loading loose patch and ball. Some evidence suggests that the trousers worn were what in the era were termed pantaloons. These were cut somewhat closer to the body than regular trousers as worn by the line, in particular the lower extremity. The hardships of campaigning may have seen these trousers replaced due to possible supply issues by either the regular grey line infantry version or locally made examples often in brown as made in the Spanish countryside from local materials. Although not used by myself, the army at the time wore shoes that were made on universal lasts with neither left nor right feet. These were covered with simple gaiters. Some sources and research point to oilskin gaiters that were quite high at the leg. Others point to the use of wool. I opted for the wool variety and made mine to be worn underneath the trousers, conveniently covering up my somewhat less than authentic footwear. Although the equipment I used when shooting the Baker was covered in part three of this series, I've made some minor adjustments to make better the complete presentation. I have added the sword in a frog, as well as replaced the very functional pouch I made to hold the short starter, priming flask, and bullets with a pouch as described in DeWitt Bailey's book, British Military Flintlock Rifles. In the style of a soft leather pouch, it has a thong for closure and the hole is covered with a flap secured with a leather button. The pouch holds approximately 30 bullets. I have also made the addition of a more appropriate haversack. Fashioned after drawings found in Pierre Turner's excellent book, Soldiers' Accoutrements of the British Army, it is of rather large proportion, and I've done my best to match some of the details. Another relatively new addition at the time of this video is an example of a knapsack. In the Napoleonic era, there was very little transport available, and soldiers had to carry their world on their backs. They wore their knapsacks practically all the time, on the march, for most military duties, and in action. Information surrounding them is quite scarce, but a few points bear mention. Knapsacks of the Napoleonic era did not have the stiffening boards of later patterns, but were rather envelope styles that simply wrapped the soldier's possessions up like the paper of a Christmas gift. Earlier, they were rectangular in design and were simply folded in half, holding the contents inside. Surviving examples from earlier in the period seem to be ochre in color with a regimental device painted in the center. According to Pierre Turner and other sources, there was an effort made to adopt a more universal version in black, this starting from 1811. This was of a similar style, but with flaps on the sides to better protect the contents. This is the style I chose to make, as it would do duty with a simple change of shoulder straps for a line infantry version, those straps being white when that becomes necessary. Mention should also be made of the term trotter as associated with these knapsacks. Often, this name is associated with the uncomfortable and stiff-sided versions of the knapsack. Two things bear mention. One, his company ceased trading in the very early 1800s. And two, as mentioned before, knapsacks of this era were not stiffened. When packaged, it comes to a rectangular shape and there is provision for the carriage of a rolled blanket or greatcoat and mess tin on top. As mentioned, it is not a backpack as we would be familiar with today, but rather just a cover for the man's possessions. As such, it lies flat when empty. 
made of linen or similar cloth. They were japanned, a generic term for blackening, and this was done with a process similar to that of making oilskin, thereby rendering the material somewhat weatherproof. The historical would seemingly have had pockets sewn to the inside for the storage of small clothes, brushes, and other hardware, but I've omitted these for the time being. The primary function of mine is to encumber, and therefore I can judge the effect it has on my shooting. These pockets can easily be added in the future, should I wish. Packing of the knapsack was quite simple. You will at once notice that the shoulder straps are actually separate items. We'll discuss their use momentarily. The knapsack was placed face down and the contents were folded neatly, an important step to preserving the shape of the knapsack, and placed in the center. The side and bottom flaps were buckled across. This seems to have been able to be done in two ways, either the side, then the bottom, or vice versa. I haven't come to the conclusion yet as to which is the better method. Once secured, it helps to push and prod the contents to ensure they fill out to a nice rectangular shape. Then the top flap was folded over and buckled closed. This brought the final shape into being. The shoulder straps could then be fitted. The shoulder straps were simple strips of leather with an extension sewn to them from the center. When fitted, they served two purposes. One was to aid in the securing of the knapsack by wrapping around it, and two, provide for the actual part that went over the shoulder as shown here. Using the guides sewn onto the rear face for that purpose, the center extension was threaded through. The running end, or the end without the buckle, was passed round the knapsack and buckled to the extension. The running end was then mated with the other half, forming the weight-bearing part of the assembly. The second strap was fixed in the same way. With the knapsack packed and in its proper shape, the greatcoat straps could then be fitted. This pattern had three and were attached using leather guides fitted to the top face. The greatcoat, or blanket as shown here, could then be rolled and buckled on with the mess tin, which of course in this case is my aiming rest. This was fixed under the center strap. Putting the knapsack on can be somewhat awkward as the shoulder straps are not adjustable while it is being worn, so throwing it over the head can be a useful technique. Once on the shoulders, the breast strap could then be done up. Although not particularly comfortable, this strap pulls the narrow shoulder straps out of the armpits. A certain amount of fiddling and adjustment is required to achieve a moderate level of comfort. As you might imagine, with one inch wide shoulder straps, and what can be a considerable weight, it's not the most comfortable piece of kit. Stories surrounding their weight and encumbrance begin to come into focus. So with these additions, the channel can now feature a rifleman with complete marching order. Relatively encumbered, he nevertheless proved his worth on many battlefields and in countless smaller actions. The jacket and trousers came from replicators in India. Unfortunately, I can't say that the experience was particularly good. The first jacket came much too short, and when its replacement arrived, with more appropriate proportions, it did so without shoulder straps. My cap is from Jim Keller in Ontario. I would definitely recommend him as a source. The quality is excellent, and the price is reasonable. Thanks to the 2nd Battalion, the 95th Rifles in the UK, for their excellent pictures and the form in helping me getting the details better. I hope that the addition of these items has made presentations featuring the baker more enjoyable and has put the use of the rifle into better context. There is perhaps no more well-known and studied mid-Victorian regiment than the 24th foot, due in large part to two movies dating from the 1960s and the 1970s no other regiment has perhaps been so much in the conscience of those interested in the Victorian Army. In a rare occurrence, both battalions of the 24th were deployed to Zululand and participated in the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. 
the 1st Battalion, had indeed been in South Africa since the mid-1870s and were experienced campaigners. The 2nd Battalion had been in England and was sent out specifically for the Zulu campaign. The 1870s were still a time when traditional colours were used in the field. The uniform of the 24th has become perhaps the most iconic of its era. The Foreign Service helmet, the scarlet frock, dark blue home service trousers, leather gaiters and boots. In common with all other infantry units during this campaign, they used the pattern 71 valise equipment in various orders of dress. During this era, there were two upper body garments issued to the man. These were the tunic and the frock. Outwardly similar, they differed in detail. From period photos, it is easy to locate the white piping down the front and the seven buttons of the tunic. Whereas the frock typically has five buttons and is without piping. The frock was the working or field garment, thus saving wear and tear on the more expensive and heavier tunic. Originally a loose-fitting, almost smock-like garment, by the 1870s the frock had been tidied up somewhat and had become essentially a plainer version of the tunic. Frocks are a very complicated subject, and they exist in a world devoid of all standardization. Suffice it to say that there were many variations from unit to unit. My frock is a representation of the type worn by the 24th in 1879. It is, of course, in the traditional color and has the green facings of the 24th shown on the cuffs and two small tabs at the collar. The latter also has the Sphinx badge as worn by that regiment. The cuff is surrounded by white piping, forming a trefoil knot in common with the tunic of this era. The frock also differed from the tunic in that it was made of somewhat harder wearing serge. It was from a run made for the Die Hard Company a living history and reenactment group out of the UK. Interestingly, I've had the occasion to wear this very frock in two different instances. The first was in 2016, when I first made the acquaintance of the Die Hard Company while on holiday in the United Kingdom. As followers of the channel Facebook page may be aware, I participated in a weekend encampment at a military affair known as Military Odyssey. It was a great time meeting the members there, and I was grateful for my inclusion in the activities presented. The frock at that time was indeed borrowed. The second occasion was quite recent from the time of this video, and was again while participating in historical activities, only this time it was in South Africa. Now there will be more information and indeed videos regarding my trip to South Africa at a future date, but suffice it to say, the Die Hard Company forming part of what was known for the trip as a Company 24th Foot was invited by the King of the Zulus himself to participate in activities commemorating the 140th anniversary of the Zulu War. I must say that visiting prominent Zulu War historical sites in formal semi-state occasions was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Many thanks to Tim and the remainder of the company for including me. After the trip, the frock found its way into my baggage after its former owner was properly compensated, of course. It wasn't the only bit of kit to find a new home in Canada. The Foreign Service helmet I wore for the South Africa trip was kindly offered to me by Tim, the group's leader. And while it is a reproduction, it is an example from a run of helmets commissioned by the company some years ago, and these helmets are generally recognized as being the gold standard of such headdress. Suffice it to say, an example of such high quality and correct pattern is next to impossible to acquire, so I jumped at the opportunity. On the topic of headdress, accompanying me to South Africa was a dark blue Glengarry and 24th foot cap badge. This was delivered at the 11th hour by Stan at the Regimental Quartermaster. He deals in all manner of Victorian kit. Drop by his Facebook page and say hello. The last piece of kit from the 24th collection was a gift of a pair of gaiters from Rob, a friend of the channel. These ubiquitous items were worn with practically every order of dress from the late 1860s on through the 1890s and were only finally phased out in the early 1900s. These examples are modern and in fact are issued to the officer cadets at Canada's military university, the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. There, the cadets wear these same leather leggings as part of their full dress on formal occasions. 
Here, a quick demonstration on how they were worn. First, the trousers were gathered about the ankle, and the gaiter was placed around the top of the boot. The laces were pushed through the eyelets, and the gaiter was laced from bottom to top. Thus, the loops created somewhat of a chain, working its way to the top of the gaiter, where the last loop was placed over the leather strap at the top. This was secured, and then the trousers were bloused over top of the gaiter. Mention might be made of some variations shown here in relation to the 24th and the 71 pattern valise equipment. There is some provenance to a very light order of dress used at times during the Zulu War. This consisted of what might be considered belt order, with just the belt and a selection of ammunition pouches worn thereon. It is suggested that this order of dress is pertinent to the two main actions fought by the 24th, Islandwana and Works Drift. Both these actions occurred while in static positions, at an established and standing camp, and a supply depot respectively. The thought being that with general movement not being the immediate goal of the forces involved, they may have used this lighter order of dress due to ammunition being at hand and the absence of the requirement to carry the main ration and the greatcoat. The haversack and water bottle being part of this order of dress. At other times, forces were on the march. As seen in this sketch, the men were required to carry their personal kit and food, with what might be termed light marching order. The breeches were worn to accommodate the greatcoat and distribute the weight of a full issue of ammunition as well as the mess tin. The valise, however, was not carried and was transported for the men in the wagons. Here we can see what that order of dress may have looked like. The greatcoat folded 15 inches across with the Glengarry tucked under the straps and the mess tin either strapped to the greatcoat or to the back of the belt. Either way, the men of the 24th would have spent countless hours wearing their kit. There have been some updates to the Great War collection of kit to support future projects that might bear mention. A new pair of boots have come my way. Boots of the Great War is a bewildering topic. Suffice it to say that there were many patterns which were brought into service as the army sought out the best version. One of these was the B2, and this dated from just before the war. Highland regiments wore shoes with gaiters. Very quickly it was decided that the shoe and gaiter combination was not quite appropriate for the coming winter conditions, and authorization was granted to replace them with boots and putties in the autumn of 1914. This combination would see the Highland regiments through to the end of the war and beyond. Replacing the colorful diced hose tops as worn with the gaiters and shoes, drab colored versions were taken into service. In May of 1915, another pattern was developed. This was known as the B5, and it's these that I've chosen to represent the boots and putties combination used for the majority of the war. They were made on a square-toed last by the millions, and their silhouette has become iconic. Here, a demonstration using the standard issue long putty. First, the hose top was pulled up and adjusted. Note the use of a normal sock underneath, and yes, it should be grey wool, not black. The putty was then wound around the ankle. The starting point is one of those trial and error things that needs to be figured out. With a double wrap at the bottom, the putty was wound around the ankle and the lower leg, always unwinding to the outside of the leg. Once complete, the tape was wound around the top and knotted with the excess tucked away. Then, peculiar to Highland regiments, a garter knot was sometimes tied on. Then, the top of the hose top was folded over, finishing the evolution. The use of the full putty was typical of the early war period, but very soon this began to be cut down for use around the ankle only. This was found to be just as effective, yet lighter and easier to don and doff. It might be of interest to some that boots of the era were actually made in brown leather, wear and the use of cleaning materials darkened them considerably. I have treated them with the historical dubbin, darkening them and giving them a dull sheen. My B5s are from William Lennon in the UK. They are extremely well made on original lasts. There are other vendors, namely Soldier of Fortune, 
also in the UK. As the war progressed, it was found that a large number of deaths and wounds were being caused by shrapnel raining down from the timed fuses used by both sides. As a counter to this, the French and the British began to experiment with steel helmets to help ease the casualty rates. The British version was placed in service in late 1915. The shrapnel helmet, as it was then known, was considered part of trench stores and remained there, rotating from unit to unit. Come 1916, the numbers of helmets had risen considerably, and the Mark I helmet would become ubiquitous, worn at all times in the line. The Mark I helmet was a round affair with a padded liner and leather chin strap. It became ubiquitous in the line and formed the key feature in defining Tommy's silhouette of the Great War. Mine is a reproduction from Soldier of Fortune in the UK. The steel is reconditioned Mark II, and the liner and chin strap are newly made. The horrifying rise of the use of gas during the war brought about the need for all personnel to be able to protect themselves. Initially, chemical-soaked pads and goggles, anti-gas equipment evolved during the war. The pH hood was common through the middle years of the war, and by 1917, a respirator had come into use. Known as the small box respirator from the canister that held the filter, it became as ubiquitous as the steel helmet. In action, it was carried at the alert, high on the chest, and the face piece was close at hand, should the call or rattle or clank of the gas alarm sound. My example is a reproduction from Soldier of Fortune in the United Kingdom, and it will be interesting to note the differences in shooting when wearing it once I have the chance to do so. The face piece was fabric, with a rubber lining and had two mica eyepieces. The inside featured a nose clip and a mouthpiece that best resembled that found on modern diving snorkels. Outside there was an exhalation valve which was a simple rubber affair allowing for easier breathing. At the other end of the hose was the filter. Both the canister and the face piece were stowed in the haversack for instant use. The haversack in the alert position was carried with the strap over the neck, and there was the ability to rig it with the whip cord attached for this purpose. By running the cord under the arms and over the strap, it pulled the weight off the back of the neck and generally stabilized the haversack on the chest. In this position, when the alarm came, the face piece was ready for quick donning. As mentioned, the reason why I decided to acquire a respirator, albeit a reproduction, was so that I'd be able to assess its effect on shooting. I foresee a field firing course set up just for that purpose. In use for at least 100 years before the Great War, the greatcoat had provided for the soldiers extra warmth, serving as an overcoat and sleeping bag in the field. Effective enough in normal conditions, the greatcoat became somewhat of a liability in the often muddy and cramped trenches. In the winter of 1914-1915, the expedient issue of other types of warm clothing was undertaken. Perhaps the most interesting of these was the goatskin jerkin. This had the hair still attached, and one can only imagine what the smell would have been like when wet. This garment was improved upon, and by 1915, a version without the hair would enter service. The leather jerkin would become a feature of cold weather clothing until well past the Second World War consisting of a sleeveless leather outer which was lined with woolen blanket material, its intended use was to be worn over the service dress tunic, although there is evidence of some men wearing it inside for some reason. There were four leather buttons down the front. Mine is a reproduction from the aforementioned Soldier of Fortune. Once donned, the equipment would then be worn over top. Not perhaps the smartest of garments, but certainly effective enough for the men to use it at every opportunity. Oh, and there might be one other addition to the Great War collection. That's right, I couldn't be a self-respecting Canadian if I didn't cover our most infamous firearm. I happen to have come by an example of a Mark III Ross, and you can best expect a full series on it in the future. The Battle of Kitchener's Wood should do nice for a backdrop, methinks. So all these new Great War pieces point 
to more Great War shooting, field firing, and perhaps other aspects of musketry in the future. So that brings us to the end of Part 6. In Part 7, we'll explore the Second World War collection. Special thanks to friend of the channel, Toby, who kindly provided the excellent study of the B-5 boot, as worn by a military policeman of the Great War. He runs the excellent Facebook page, The British Army and Navy, from 1888 to 1914. Stop by and say hello. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.